Thank you very much, Sean. Um, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to, uh, to talk here. What I wanted to do um, is give you a brief tour of the kind of interesting developments that we see in what we call the cyber underground in our talk, Taking the Temperature um, of the Cyber Underground. Um, I will switch off my video now so you can focus, you can all focus on my slides and also the background of my study. Um, so with that, we will get started. So what I wanted to cover in um, roughly 35 minutes that are available to, to me um, is before we get started, I want to talk, tell you a little bit about us because who is Intel 471 and why would we be talking about the, the cyber underground? Um, and then kind of setting the scene, I'll explain to you a little what we mean by the term cyber underground um, and also introduce kind of the theme um, or the structure that we that I've built this presentation around we call the MIA or the Malware Information and Access Cycle. Um, and then we'll dive in, we'll take the temperature of the underground, um, which of course will be uh, lots of very scary things and we don't want to leave you with that at the end. I'm going to finish off with some top tips, uh, top gear top tips on staying out of trouble. Um, before we uh, get started, um, I do want to um, uh, kind of talk about the elephant in the room. Um, and that elephant, of course, is Corona. Um, it's the reason we're all sitting behind our desks today instead of um, physically coming together. Um, and that, uh, I have to admit, has meant that I've kind of changed this, this presentation around a little. Um, in Usually we do these in smaller settings and then um, instead of a somewhat lighter Mexican beer, um, we can do presentations which are darker and more heavier beers. Um, but because this is a, a broader audience, um, I've slightly changed the presentation to make sure that um, everyone will be able to follow along um, and it is suitable for a more, more public audience here. So um, the fact that it's not a heavy Belgian beer is not a problem because um, this light, refreshing Mexican beer with the well-known name is, is very good, especially with a slice of lime. So... A little bit um, about Intel 471. Who are we and what do we do? Um, we're a cyber threat intelligence company, um, and we focus on two things, which is adversary intelligence and malware intelligence. We collect that intelligence um, using a team of experienced researchers, which are dotted around the globe, and they focus on, on the one hand, on actors and the actor communications, and on the other hand, on the tools and the tooling that they're using. Uh, malware and malware infrastructures. Um, we collect that intelligence and we bring that to our customers. And you'll be happy to know that we have multiple customers in multiple industries dotted around the globe. But that's our speciality is getting into these closed off communities um, and blending in, finding out what they're all up to. So what's the, what's the idea behind this? Why would you do this? And this is not just particular, uh, it apply to us, it applies to this whole industry in general, the idea of what we want to do is we want to help our customers move from a purely reactive approach to a more proactive stance when it comes to mitigating cyber risks. Um, I think that's the, the correct term. So if you were faced with this in the words of the uh, wise philosopher Jeremy Clarkson, you would say, how hard could this possibly be securing my organization? I just plug all the holes, patch all the vulnerabilities, and the job is done. Um, of course, when you're active and when you've been trying to do this for a while, you discover there are more holes and more vulnerabilities and the job is never done. So at some point, instead of just looking at you and your own attack surface, you start broadening your horizon and looking out. Um, and after you looked at your sector and um, the organizations like you to see what's hitting them, you move beyond the perimeter and you start looking um, usually initially at the technology but later on actually realizing that there's an actor or a person behind all that adversarial uh, malware that's being lobbed at you. And you start focusing also on the actor and the actor communications. And that's where our adversary and malware approach fits in. What we try and do, what we want to do, um, is help our customers support their decisions on the three layers of intelligence, the strategic, the operational, and the tactical. Um, this is very important, and a key part of that intelligence is that it helps support, deci support decisions. 
Um, and we don't we want to move beyond just the tactical. The tactical are examples of compromised accounts or IP addresses or URLs that host malware. That's very tactical information. It's very good. It's very valid. And we also call it actionable. You know what to do with it. But to gain a broader understanding of the whole ecosystem allows you to make more operational and strategic decisions, position yourselves better. Um, and that is what we try and, and help our customers achieve. So I've talked a bit about the cyber underground. Um, also, there's a reason we call it the cyber underground. Um, and I'll talk a bit about the, the, in, uh, the cycle that powers so much of it. We try and avoid uh, the term deep and dark web. I know that there's a lot of uh, people talk about the deep and dark web. Um, we also think that ice and icebergs, um, well, not icebergs as a whole, but certainly ice belongs in your drink. Uh, and icebergs um, basically have very little place in cyber threat intelligence. So the, we like to think of this as not so much a deep, deep and dark web sounds very Hollywood. It's very magical. It's very spooky. Um, and it is almost endless and limitless. And we think the truth is, is a bit different. It's actually not as big as you think. Um, and it is fairly structured. Um, and the reason is there's a lot of actors there that are trying to achieve something. And to achieve that, they need help. They need to communicate with others. They need to find like-minded individuals that will help them. Um, and actually, in a very large and very dark and deep web, that becomes really difficult. So actually, it's rather self-organizing and self and, and structured in a way. Um, and we basically distinguish three main pillars, um, products, services, um, and goods. So products are things like malware and phishing kits, web injects, kind of like the tools that you use to, to um, basically commit all your nefarious activities. Um, the services are the bits that help with that, the intangibles, bulletproof hosting, exploit kits, um, bits you rent, et cetera. And the goods, but once you take your, your tools and your services and you apply them, you end up with goods. And the goods are the end result. Um, and that's the, the part that you can buy, sell, trade, or um, pass off to someone else where it starts to power another cycle or another value chain. And in this underground structure, call it a marketplace or an ecosystem, um, you have all, all kinds of actors with various motivations. Some of them are financial, others nation state. Um, espionage, hacktivism, um, and they are buying, selling, discussing, planning, developing all these products, these services, and procuring or selling or um, goods. That is what we call the cyber underground. And in um, actual fact, it is fairly structured. And if you understand it, if you understand how it works, um, you can actually make better, kind of better mitigate risks um, for your organization. Now, what I want to do in this presentation, kind of taking the temperature of the cyber underground, is do a kind of an overview, an overflight of some of the interesting developments that we see. Some of them are fairly recent. Um, some of them have been going on for a for a very long time, but I want to show how they interlock. And kind of the, the theme that I'm going to use to show how all these various moving parts click together and slot together is something which I call the MIA cycle. Um, at its heart, it's the malware information and access cycle. You obtain some kind of information. In most cases, it'll be, for instance, account information. You use that to obtain some access to an otherwise closed off um, resource, for instance, your PC. And you use that access to install malware. You use the malware to steal more information. The cycle repeats. And the longer you do this, it's like a flywheel. The longer you do this, the better you get at it and it, the more it starts to accelerate and gain momentum. Now, you can basically enter or leave this cycle at any point you want. You can buy or sell malware installations if you want to get started. You can buy or sell information, the credentials that gain the access. And you can actually buy and sell the access itself. And for all this buying, selling, acquiring, or trading, it's very handy that you have this structured cyber underground. And this cycle um, and its various entry and exit points are kind of like a value chain. They power a lot of what happens in the cyber underground. Now, are we solely concerned about kind of perpetuating this cycle? No, of course not. But once we have this core, we can use it to do other things. So instead of taking information with, like credentials, we can also steal data. We can use our access to steal data and try and monetize that data. 
Um, or if we have espionage as our motivation, we're not monetizing the data. The data is our end goal, our end objective. But we use this cycle to get to that data. Um, if we have malware, we can install other malware. One prime example would be we can use malware to drop ransomware and then try and monetize this the, the malware install that we have in that particular way. Um, and finally, malware can serve as a platform. We can basically use that to move around an organization or a network and find other targets. This is kind of the MIA circle, um, the MIA cycle. And I'll be referring back to it um, over the course of my my presentation. And this is kind of the map that shows you how these varying bits fit together. So let's start looking at the underground perspective and let's start taking the temperature of the cyber underground. Now, as I've said, the elephant in the room is Corona. Um, as you may have noticed, the world is undergoing a bit of a pandemic right now. And this certainly hasn't escaped um, the attention of the actors in the cyber underground. Um, I think there'll be a couple of talks and have been a couple of talks today already about actors using or abusing um, Corona or COVID-19 to spread malware um, and for phishing campaigns, et cetera. And um, I'll start off with one that we caught, um, that we came across our radar um, earlier. It's actually, I think, nicely ties into a report that uh, Palo Alto's Unit 42 um, published just very recently. Um, this one's actually from February this year, and you already see um, cyber actors using the corona, um, it wasn't pandemic back then, the corona crisis to spread malware. In this particular instance, um, it's very interesting. This is a spam email purporting to be from the World Health Organization, which is sent to um, recipients in the shipping industry saying that there's a new, um, there's a new procedure that all um, captains, all masters of a vessel must adhere to. Um, it has a very handy Excel sheet attached to it. And what you do prior to coming into port, you have to, for a couple of days, take the temperature of the crew, record them in the Excel sheet, and then send that to the master of the harbor so he can see if anybody on this on this ship um, has corona or not. Um, it's very interesting because it, it almost sounds believable. Um, and of course, what the actors are doing, because these are um, uh, these are these are times when we deviate from normal procedure, they immediately use that to their advantage. Um, now, the Excel sheet in question, of course, um, actually has a complete other, um, uh, other purpose. The purpose is to install malware. The malware that it installs is an, a malware family called Hawkeye. And Hawkeye um, is a category of malware we call an info steal. And what it will steal is passwords and anything you enter on the keyboard. And so the idea is to steal information. And the way this Excel sheet does that, it actually abuses um, a um, abuses a function in Microsoft Office called the um, equation editor. Um, so it uses, and that the vulnerability in the equation editor is actually um, very old. It's a three-year-old vulnerability. Um, now, malware-laden spam targeted at the shipping industry using a three-year-old vulnerability. Um, and the reason for this, the shipping industry, is probably because the actors read about the Maersk incident, where Maersk, a large shipping uh, organization, <coughs> got um, hit by ransomware. So there's every chance um, that the actors have read all the reporting there and thought, oh, hang on, the shipping industry, well, there's an, an industry that seems to be behind on patching a little. Let's try hitting them with this. Um, so is this vulnerability actually old? You bet it's old. Um, as a vulnerability, it's a very interesting one. Um, if you've ever, it's, it, it was actually contained in the least used bit of Microsoft Office, which is the equation editor. Um, and not only that, but it was, um, it was contained in a very old version of the equation editor, which normally only gets called upon if you find very old Office documents, which actually had an equation in them. Um, so I think this, this kind of qualifies for the absolutely least touched bit of code inside all of Microsoft Office. Um, and is it old? Yes, it's more than three years old. <clears throat> and one of the things we do is we track vulnerabilities um, as they're being discussed in the underground. And the idea behind that is to help our customers prioritize patching. Uh, patching is a massive challenge for a lot of organizations. And um, one of the things is there's so much to patch that people need to prioritize. And one way of looking at this is looking for state changes in actors discussing or being able to exploit certain vulnerabilities. 
And so what we're looking at with this vulnerability intelligence dashboard is we're looking for vulnerabilities where something has changed, which means that actors may not be able to exploit this yesterday, but they will be tomorrow. So today is a good day to start action. And this vulnerability, CVE 2017-11882, is that on that dashboard? No, it isn't. And we do have a, a report for it, um, actually a historical report, because that one is, is three years old. It's not, nothing has changed in it. People have been able to exploit this one for a very long time. Um, for instance, here we have a report about an actor um, offering an exploit back that actually contains that particular, and one of the vulnerabilities it's able to use is exactly that one, published on the 24th of November in 2017. Um, another one, an, an actor on hack, for, hack forums offering um, another exploit kit for Word available, again, with this vulnerability in it, dated in August, 2018. So there's actually already several exploit kits using this particular vulnerability. Um, and you actually basically should have patched this one by now. So if this isn't the one that we're watching for, what else, what is new, what is interesting, what is it that you should be keeping your eye on? Let's continue a little further on with our tour of the cyber underground. Um, and the next, the group that I wanted to talk about next is a group called TA505. They are an interesting group and certainly want to keep an eye on. Um, I actually believe looking at the, uh, the agenda, there's another talk on them today. Um, and TA505 is a fairly sophisticated group, and they're over here on the left. They're in the malware and the platform and the ransomware side of things. Um, their main aim is to infect machines with malware and then to monetize that in some way, either by moving through the organization um, and um, uh, moving through the organization and then um, stealing money or, in some cases, dropping ransomware. So this group is sophisticated. Um, it's been around since 2014, at least, um, and up till very recently, they were uh, well known for using the Neckers botnet for doing massive spam runs, which were dropping malware. Um, there's a lot of research in them, especially by uh, Proofpoint, obviously um, have a keen interest in anything to do with spam. Um, and actually, by their tally, a lot of the historical biggest mal spam runs in the world um, in successive years all came from. TA505. I say used because actually earlier this year, a month ago, uh, Microsoft launched an operation together with partners to take down the Neckers botnet. Um, and it seems to have gone very quiet. So TA505 is probably um, looking for new ways to, sp to uh, spread their malware. And interestingly enough, I know there's one talk today um, where they seem to be using some innovative new ways um, of getting malware onto machines. However, through their, when they were still using spam messages, messages um, they had a variety of ways to kind of get the malware on the machine. Uh, Word documents or office documents with macros in them, um, loaders, um, all kinds of small pieces of code that would reach out and download um, uh, malware. Their main motivation is very simple. They want the, its financial gain. Um, and their targets are organizations all over the world. They have basically, um, we see them tar targeting countries and organizations basically across the globe. They're very um, sophisticated, they're very mature, and they have a very broad reach. The malware that they've actually used, so the eventual malware that gets dropped onto the machine has been a mix. It's been banking malware, um, also info stealers, um, remote access tools, toolkits, um, but also ransomware. And they've been around for so long, since 2014, that actually um, they've had to change or change their the, the malware that they use because sometimes the malware families they relied on simply disappeared, either because the author stopped supporting them um, or they were taken down through international uh, coordination between security companies and law enforcement, for instance. So they've been known to use Drydex, Tripbot, Shifu, Gigotech, Jaff, Philadelphia, Global Imposter, and recently um, they've kind of returned to ransomware um, and started using CLOP. And over on the right, we've got some, um, I just called some articles from the press um, from incidents that uh, TA505 was possibly involved in. Um, so we've had the University of Maastricht in the Netherlands hit with a ransomware attack, CLOP. Um, they actually paid somewhere around 250,000 euros to get, their, to get access to their um, infrastructure back, to basically get the university up and running again. 
Um, and that's a good indicator that people are making serious money doing this. Um, a, uh, an article from that fount of, of knowledge um, and, uh, and straight up reporting the register um, about a French, uh, a French hospital um, that actually got hit with clock ransomware. 6,000 PCs um, were locked in that particular incident in November of last year. And that hospital allegedly is, was not paying the ransom. And then a recent one, um, Croatia's INA um, petrol, petrol station chain, actually energy company, uh, got hit with ransomware. Again, it was CLOP, um, so possibly TA505 is impl implicated there as well. Um, and that kind of brings us on to the next uh, kind of trend, or I think that we is a, a kind of a continuous background noise, which is ransomware. Um, CLOP is certainly not the only group. And one of the trends now with a number of groups is that they actually target organizations. They're not trying to encrypt individual PCs anymore. They want to encrypt entire networks, much like they did with the University of Maastricht, for instance, and then demand large ransoms to get an organization to pay up and basically get, get them access to their infrastructure back. Um, now, there's another trend that has recently popped up. It's basically become kind of a um, one started doing it um, and then everybody else followed. Um, they're now all building platforms to release data from any victim organizations which refuse to pay. So if we look at our um, French hospital um, in, the, in the previous example, um, they refuse to pay. Well, from now on, you run the chance that uh, not only do you have to restore from backup, but they also might um, sell or publish dump your information on these platforms. I say platforms because each of them is coming up with their own. Um, one of them is uh, doing it on a file sharing platform, so basically a pastebin like uh, platform. Others have uh, set up their own blogs in Tor Onion sites. Maze was the first to do it, um, but Doppel, Paymar, Megacourt, it's Nemti, and Revil, or so do Wiki, um, have all followed suit. Um, and basically, it is seen. It's it's a they could, they achieve two goals with that. Um, one, it's an extra motivation for afflicted, afflicted organizations to pay up. Um, and secondly, some of them are publishing it. Others are first offering the information for sale, and then uh, once they've done monetizing it that way, then they'll publish it. Um, this approach was predicted um, earlier, but now. Um, in the, the early 2020, we see all of these uh, groups suddenly starting to do it. Um, if we take our French hospital from just now um, as an example, there was another interesting development. I haven't put it on this, this slide because I don't think you should, um, there's any, you should definitely not rely on this. Um, Maze, I think it was Maze came out with a press release because yes, um, they called it a press release because ransomware groups now have press releases saying that they were stopping, uh, they were no longer targeting because of the corona pandemic, they would no longer target um, the health sector. Um, others said, well, we never targeted the health sector in the first place. Um, I think we should take all these uh, promises from cyber criminals with a slight grain of salt, because I think about two days after releasing this quote unquote press release, um, Mays published um, information from a London clinic, uh, which had refused to pay up. So either someone in the group hadn't quite got the memo, um, or they, are, they have a very odd uh, definition of what is the health industry. Um, if you're, in the health, if you're in, the, in the health industry, you should definitely not be relying on the kindness of cyber criminals, um, but basically um, try and, and protect from this threat as best you can. Best you can. So the next um, bit in the, in the cycle that I want to talk about is, is access, buying or selling access to organizations or buying or access, uh, selling access to the data that organizations have. Um, this was a trend that kind of ex that really took off in 2019 and uh, last year. Um, when um, we started doing this, there were two actors that really were kind of the poster children of this, this new development. Um, started advertising this in 2019, but now we have, by my count, there is more than a dozen actors that are doing this. And we very regularly see um, actors in the underground offering for sale access to organizations. Um, and it's large organizations, Fortune 100 companies um, get hit by this, not just smaller organizations. So FXMSP and The Joker are two actors um, in the underground that started doing this. 
Um, basically, what they abuse are existing methods that organizations have to give their employees remote access to company um, company infrastructure. So things like remote desktop protocols, Citrix, um, open shares if you have them, um, VPNs, any other access protocols, they will try and abuse. What they do is quite often the initial way in is to get access to webmail. Um, so that's the, the initial way in. They will try and gain access to um, webmail account for an employee, either through password reuse or because an info stealer has stolen credentials. Um, and then from that, they'll pivot onto the, um, the RDP or the Citrix gateway, and that way they get access to the, uh, the, the organization. And that basically is where their involvement ends. Um, they, will, um, they will then sell that access or they sell the data that that account has access to. So if you have a Citrix account which has, um, has a desktop which has access to a bunch of network shares and folders, they will simply uh, offer to sell that data or just sell you the whole access um, as a whole. Um, if they can't get any further, they will try and download the global address list. So if they have access to your webmail, your Office 365 or a hosted exchange organization, um, they'll download the global address list and sell that on. Um, and that is, of course, uh, then used by others for targeted phishing campaigns, etc. cetera. Um, their targeting is actually opportunistic. Um, so the organizations that get hit with this, um, they weren't specifically targeted. Um, these actors are phishing with a very broad net. And whoever ends up uh, unfortunate enough to be caught up in the net will be the one that they start to focus on and the access that they sell. Um, you might remember the names FXMSP and the Joker because uh, towards the end of 2019, um, a, uh, a small New York um, intelligence company published a, a blog on them, um, which also caused both of the actors to kind of uh, lay low um, and disappear off the, uh, uh, kind of off the face of the underground as they, uh, they didn't like this particular form of attention. So the next next kind of part of the cycle is, is, is across the malware and information. It is the buying, selling, and acquiring of accounts. Um, so kind of the credentials and the information. A lot of that is actually powered by malware. And a very popular category of malware, we mentioned it um, earlier with that spam email that we saw, Hawk, Hawkeye, is in our info stealers. So info stealers are a category of malware um, that is basically focused on just stealing credentials. Um, or making it possible to gain access to credentials. There's a kind of important distinction. They're not just stealing credentials. They're stealing credentials, browser history, cookies, um, but also um, kind of the characteristics of your, the property, the characteristics of your device, what type of browser, what, what brand of laptop, for instance, um, screen resolution, all these things so that um, whoever buys these credentials is then able to emulate the victim as closely as possible, including, for instance, session cookies, usernames, passwords, et cetera, um, and gain access to accounts. One of the reasons to, to grab session cookies, for instance, if you've ever um, logged into a website that's protected with two-factor authentication, um, you usually get the option to trust this device, and then username and password is sufficient from then on in. The, the website won't ask you for two-factor authentication for that device or that browser. That's usually based on cookies and a bunch of other um, characteristics of the browser that are recorded at, at that time. Um, and so basically, by stealing all of that, the info stealer, the, the, the actual actor hopes to be able from a different device to log in and not get challenged for two-factor authentication. So these, um, these couple of families, the, the most popular ones are Azeroth, Predator, the Thief, and Hawkeye, um, actually are focused on doing just that. Um, there's also a huge number of banking malware families, such as Dana Bot um, and others, which also have this capability built in. Um, sometimes the actors running these banking malware botnets start pivot away into becoming an info stealer. And sometimes they just basically, this is an extra little add on, another way to monetize their bots. Um, these, there are huge numbers of installs out there, and they're all stealing huge numbers of, of passwords to every single site that, you're, that the victim is visiting. Um, so that's one way of gaining access and, or grabbing information. Um, another, is to simply try and brute force your way in. Uh, it's called account takeover. And so now we're not actually using malware. Um, what we're actually abusing um, is people's tendency to reuse passwords. 
um, all over the place. And the other tendency that quite a lot of sites um, require make you use your email address to log in, which basically means across a lot of different websites, your username is consistent. It's your email address. Um, and the site and sites say, well, that's not really a problem because the password will always be different, right? And that's where password reuse comes in. Um, now, password reuse on its own, really nice, but the, the kind of thing that made it all possible is the fact that there are long, long lists of leaked credentials out there. Websites have gotten hacked. They didn't store passwords in an encrypted uh, form. So basically, there are huge collections of combinations of usernames and plain text passwords, billions of them. Um, and here's where the password reuse comes in. If someone has used the password on um, a site, for instance, LinkedIn got hacked in 2012. That's a, a huge cache of passwords right there. Um, if they also use that on their Yahoo webmail, same password, well, we could try logging in with that password on Yahoo. That's what account takeover um, looks like. Now, that sounds like a lot of hard work. Um, and that's why a lot of, um, and, and basically that's what we have computers for. So this whole process of automating um, kind of trying all these passwords on different sites has been automated by a bunch of, of tools, account takeover tools. One of the most popular ones and well-known um, is Sentry MBA. Um, it's a tool for doing exactly that. It's fairly sophisticated, um, fairly nice, um, and it offers a couple of um, neat, quote unquote, neat functionalities. One is you can basically load it with a configuration on the target website that you're trying to gain access to. So basically, you need to tell it how does the login page work and what does a successful login look like. You also give it a list of proxies. And then as you're trying all your different passwords, you keep coming from different IP addresses. So in the logs, it won't look like one, uh, one IP address is trying a, a million accounts. It looked like lots of IP addresses trying to log in, um, except there's a little issue with the um, username and password. So. Um, the tool itself is actually free, um, and you need the tool, you need these lists with usernames and passwords to, to try and um, to, for it to try. And um, you're, if you want to, you need a list of proxies that it can route its traffic through. Um, the config files are actually really for a specific website, for the website that you're trying to, um, to target, you'll need a config file. These are fairly easy to come by. And there's a bunch, if you Google, uh, there's a bunch of them that you can download um, for fairly well-known uh, websites that people want accounts on, stuff like Netflix, Spotify, um, PayPal, all those others. Um, of course, they will all be uh, trying to detect the use of, of Century MBA and tools like it. Um, if you want to, if there's a specific site that you want to target, um, you can also get someone to write the content for you. Um, or you can even write it yourself. It's not massively difficult. Um, but if um, if the config you want isn't available for free, they're actually fairly cheap to get someone to write them for you. Um, and if you want to know how to use Century MBA, um, there are many, many tutorials. And, and again, kind of a proof that it's not always the deep and dark web, um, YouTube has a fair amount of them. Um, and that's certainly not deep or uh, certainly not the deep and dark web. Um, so the cyber underground stretches all over, um, as it were. So we're, we're, we're taking and grabbing all these accounts. Um, and we have basically all these bits of the cycle um, end up with us taking things. Um, so where does it all go? Um, where does all this information and all this data go? Um, and where does it eventually end up? I think this is the bit where the underground shops come in. Um, underground web shops that allow you to buy and sell um, any type of data, um, especially for instance, credentials. So one of the things you have in the underground uh, are credential shops. Um, fairly sophisticated looking ones. This is a, a very popular one called Slilp. Um, as you see, very nice login screen, um, a username and a password. Note the fact that they're using Capture. Um, apparently, um, they, for some reason, are very well aware of the dangers um, of account takeover and brute forcing. So a lot of the stolen information and the credentials often end up in these shops. Um, and they're, they're basically underground shops um, selling anything from accounts to credit card, card data, um, and any other type of data um, that actors are, are looking to sell. 
Um, you can buy them, you can either buy a list of accounts from one particular kind of web property that you're interested in, um, but there are also shops that allow you to buy one victim's almost entire online identity. Um, whatever, whatever takes your fancy, whatever you, you, uh, you desire. So if you log into um, if you log into Slope here, you can see the, the interface. Um, as you can see, um, there's actually, they're talking about refunds. A lot of the credentials that you buy come with a warranty or a guarantee, um, same for credit cards, Amazon accounts, et cetera. If they don't work, just return them to the shop and they'll give you a new one. They have so many accounts, they can actually um, refund or basically exchange those. Um, of course, once, so long as you, you play by the rules of the shops, they're not, um, there are certain restrictions on stuff that doesn't work and then they won't refund you. So, um, by the way, this is, it shows you the little interface for Slilp where you can select the particular shops, that, you know, the particular sites that you're interested in. Um, the green number in the middle is the amount of credentials they have in stock at that particular moment in time. As you can see, it's more than 50 million uh, accounts. So we're kind of, kind of, this is where the cycle comes complete, right? A lot of the um, data that ends up in these shops comes from our malware information access cycle. So it's the, for a lot of people, this is the, the end goal, um, monetize data through here. But for others, it's the start. Um, they will actually buy data here and then use that um, to, to kick off their value chain. So for instance, if you're doing ransomware, you can go through the shop and look to see if they have any um, accounts for particular organizations that you're interested in. Did someone capture webmail credentials, for instance? Um, and you can then use that to gain access to Citrix and possibly sell that on and someone else uses that to drop ransomware. Um, now the really, basically it's a, again, economies of scale. Um, the really popular web properties, stuff like uh, Amazon, PayPal, but also banks, they have their own dedicated listings. So basically you can buy these in bulk, uh, but you can also search for very niche and very specific accounts. Um, and as I said, all of them come back by a warranty. So that's kind of the cycle, um, and we're, we're coming towards the end of the presentation. I do want to, um, and all of this, of course, is, is uh, we now move towards kind of more of the good news. We don't want to end on, a, on, a, on the note where we're saying, well, everything in the underground is terribly frightening. Um, actually, um, we talked about how actors are abusing COVID-19, but at the same time, COVID-19 is also affecting uh, the underground. Um, on the forums, we see many skimmers who are, loudly and specifically complaining um, that the number of cards that are being presented are way down and so they are not skimming as many cards um, as they um, as they wanted to. Um, at the same time on many of the forums we see actors discussing they're um, also very worried uh, about their own health and they're looking for advice um, and the underground wouldn't be the underground if all kinds of other actors then jump in and um, offering all kinds of cures and, and good advice um, or offering to, to help you be protected against COVID with all kinds of um, um, cures that don't work. Basically, the scammers are, are turning on, um, on, their, uh, on other uh, participants or actors in the underground. By the way, that's a continuous um, thing, by the way, but now they're just using COVID-19 for it. So at the end of the day, um, all the actors in the underground, please remember, they're only human and they're affected by the same things as the rest of us. So I wanted to leave you with a couple of um, top tips. Um, so what can you do to stay out of trouble and not fall victim um, to this kind of stuff? And this is not an exhaustive list, uh, but it's just a couple of top tips. Um, the first one, patch, 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 patch all the things, or patch as many things as you can. Um, again, what we see with a lot of organizations, if there is too much to patch, uh, prioritization becomes an issue, um, and then you need to find ways to help you figure out which are the um, which patches should go on first. Um, another very very important thing: put two-factor authentication on everything externally. Um, you might even use it internally within the network as well for sensitive um, uh, sensitive resources. But certainly, anything that's external facing, that's internet accessible, you uh, in this day and age, a username and a password. Um, I hope if you take anything away from what I've just been talking about, um, a username and a password is no longer sufficient to protect that. Um, also consider basically protecting it by requiring VPN access to access services like remote desktop protocol, et cetera. And basically anything external 
use a VPN. Um, and then when you're using these things, make sure that you're logging, you, you log, um, first off, you log and uh, hopefully also monitor your logs. That way you get alerted if anything goes wrong. But the ability, having logs when there's an incident is incredibly valuable. If we look at all these, um, for instance, going back to FXMSP and the Joker, instances where they have access to organization, the question becomes, did they take data? Did someone else access it? How much, if they took something, how much did they take? Um, and if you have logs, maybe those can help you look back and answer those questions. Without them, um, it all you will just have to wait um, and see what happens. And finally, um, use cyber threat intelligence to broaden your understanding. But of course, you're all going, he would say that, wouldn't he? Um, but in all seriousness, I hope that um, this presentation has shown that having a broader understanding of what's out there and how the various parts all interlock helps you to make the right decisions on mitigating all the risks associated with that. Um, and with that, ladies and gentlemen, um, I will say thank you very much.